Hello and good afternoon. My name is Anissa Ryland and I work at the Johnson Center for Child Health and Development here in Austin, Texas. Today we're going to be talking about ways to organize your family and thrive in the chaos that often exists when busy families go about their lives and, and some tips and tricks for how to handle some of that. So part of why we wanted to talk about this today was, you know, this is my dream that you know, I could be the Pied Piper leading um, the cats, as, so to speak, in this uh, particular cartoon. You know, it seems often in our daily lives, you know, we're, we're going in all these different directions. Our kids are going in different directions. We need to work or, or do things at home or take care of our partner or spouse or ourselves or our kids. And sometimes that doesn't all seem to be heading in the right direction. And so there are some things you can do that can make that a little easier. And I have made it my mission to talk to as many people as possible to see what they do that they seem to think is helpful so that I can share that with myself and with you. And so that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today. So uh, anybody who's ever been around a cat knows why the saying, uh, it's like herding cats, is funny and can see how that would apply to this topic and why we're going to talk about it today. So today we're going to talk about just some general organization tips and tricks, the palm book, and some first steps to take. But let's start with general organization. So what are some things you can do to get your family a little more centered, a little more organized, and headed in the right direction? The first step is to take a first step. It's really easy to get paralyzed by all of this and um, get into a place where you don't quite know what to do because it seems so daunting and overwhelmed and overwhelming. And I've certainly been there. So it's kind of that, you know, the meal is eaten one bite at a time. You really just have to take that first step and decide what is the thing you want to focus on first. So if you kind of take a minute and think about what are the things that um, prevent you from doing the things you want to do? What are the things you struggle with most? Are you consistently late or missing appointments? Are, do you feel like you're always looking for misplaced things? Do you feel like um, you just don't have it all together so that you could even convey to a friend or a partner, spouse, uh, sitter, family member, hey, this is what you could help me with? Uh, think about and kind of prioritize where you think you can start that would make the biggest difference and start there. So it's really important just to keep calm and start on one thing. It's also equally important to set reasonable goals for yourself so that you're successful. For those of you who have children who are in educational or therapeutic programs, you know we know this to be true. We really want to set them up to succeed. We want to give them manageable goals. Um, it's true for all of us. We need to be successful so that we can, can continue to be successful. And so we want to build some confidence and some confidence and take those positive steps to move forward. So it's really important to do that yourself. And sometimes it's hard, you know, when you get uh, lost in the Pinterest perfect world and you see these pictures of these, you know, beautiful houses with these organized closets and playrooms and kitchens and everything got its labeled box and its frilly bow around it and it looks so perfect. You know, it's easy to think mine's never going to look like that, so why start? Um, if yours does like, look like that, kudos to you. I want you to write me and tell me how you do it. Uh, but if it doesn't, that's okay. Um, you know, all of us could probably make our closet look like that with a little bit of time. The trick is it would look like that for one picture and then be undone 10 seconds later. So we want to have reasonable goals, but we want goals that would make meaningful difference to our families. So that's going to be a little bit different for everyone. So you just want to think about that as you make your plan moving forward. So the first thing we're going to talk about is paper. Um, anybody who has children knows that children come with an inordinate amount of paper. They may not come with uh, owner's manuals, but they certainly come with a lot of paper after the fact. And if you have a child that has health issues or any um, challenges at school or things like that, it, there's even more paper. So whether it's you know report cards and teacher's notes and IEP documents and diagnostic evaluations and lab reports and speech therapy reports and OT and PT um, and tax receipts and all of that stuff that just always seems to be a lot of paper coming into the house, whether it's in backpacks or mail or whatever it is. And so you have to come up with a system to deal with the paper or it accumulates into large piles everywhere and then you can't find it when you need it. And so come up, the first step is really just to designate a place that it all comes in, this one place. If it comes in a backpack, if it comes in the mail, if someone carries it in, it goes in this one place. And that way it's all together 
and it's easy to see, whoa, that stack's getting out of control. And you can also then schedule time. Um, in my house, we schedule time once a week to go through it, throw away what isn't needed. Now, the one caveat I will say is daily, I go through the mail and throw away the junk mail or recycle it because that can add to the stack really quickly. So once I bring the mail in, I go through and you know, it seems like half of it goes in the recycling bin. But that cuts down on my inbox stack. You want to choose a system um, that works for you, and it could be a combination of all of these things. If you're a really wired person who loves your scanner, you may be all electronic. That's not me. The scanner rejects me. Um, you know, whether it's binders, if you have a binder for each of your children, if it's um, you know files in a file cabinet, that's great too. Or a combination of all of those things works. But choose what system works for you. You want to purge at least once per year. Two to three times is better. Um, but schedule it so that you know it happens. But it's really important, you know, a lot of that information quickly becomes out of date and isn't needed anymore or gets replaced with more current information. So you want to go through and purge. That doesn't mean you have to throw it away, but you need to have uh, your current files, so the things that are the most current information. And just like your tax receipts, you know, we keep them on hand for seven years, ten years, but we don't need to keep them in our desk drawer or on top of our desk. They can be in file boxes, in the closet, the attic, the basement, the storage uh, room, whatever it is. They don't need to be at your fingertips. So only keep the most current information where you can easily get to it and have a filing or storage system for the rest. So just keep that most recent information accessible. If you do have electronic files, and chances are you'll have some form of it, back it up. And I know that that is really, you, everybody says, well, yeah, of course, but, you know, when you poll people, how often do you back up your information? I'm often shocked by the answers that I get, but if you've ever been in a situation where you've lost that data, you know how painful it is, so be sure and have a backup. Uh, for email information, have email folders. Uh, whatever system works for you, for me, you know, each of my children has their own email folder in my email inbox, and under that there are subfolders that say school, you know, therapy or medical, social, and that way, as soon as that email comes in, it goes into the right folder. It's not cluttering up my general inbox, and I can easily find it when I need it. For all that paper that comes in that are keepsake items, whether those are cards your children have made you, art projects they've made, reports they've written, certificates that they've gotten, and awards and accolades, that's all wonderful stuff. Some people are great at purging it. I am not. I want to keep it all forever. Um, so you have to come up with a system. So there are lots of suggestions on ways you can do that, but if you just have a box with each kid's name on it and a file for each year, that's one thing you can do. Um, I had a friend once suggested to me, and it was a great suggestion, that any of the 3D items your kids make, you know, clay projects, things like that, take a picture of it and save the picture, then give the actual object to a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle, a godparent. It's a great way to upcycle and spread the love, um, and then you still have the picture and it stays in your file box, but you don't end up with 75 uh, ceramic bowls. So come up with a way that those all find a home that doesn't clutter up your space. Most important things we've said here are to schedule time to take care of this. Um, it's really important. Put it on the calendar. You know, pour yourself um, a cup of tea or make yourself a treat. Sit down once a week. Go through and keep yourself up to date. You know, Wednesday nights, 9 to 10 o'clock, a great time to go through your inbox. A daily checklist is a fantastic way to keep you and your family organized and focused. It can look like a lot of different things, whether that's just an app or a list on your phone, you know, a piece of paper that you write it out. For me, I like to write it where everybody can see it so that everybody gets on board. In our family, we have, I lovingly call it the war board. It's just a dry erase board hanging in our kitchen. And it's a way that I can communicate with everyone in my family the plan for that day. So ideally, the night before I sit down, I think through the next day's activities, and I write it out. And that way everybody knows what's happening, everybody knows what part they play, and it doesn't get missed. So here's an example of what that might look like. Um, go through each person in your family and what their schedule is, what they need to do, where they need to be, how they're going to get there, what they need to take with them. And so it's a great way just to think through and plan. You know, in doing it, you may go, oh, yeah, you were supposed to take your baseball glove with you. Go put that in your bag. Oh, yeah, you needed to turn in that permission slip. Go get it and put it in your backpack. So it's kind of an accountability checklist as well as a way to communicate with everyone and get them involved in making sure everything gets done. 
To do that, it's also important to have a family calendar or schedule. Um, that can look like a lot of different things, and everybody's system may be different. Think about what might work for your family. That might be a dry erase board on the wall where everyone has their own color, and you write it. It could be there's lots of um, pre-printed family calendars that you can get. Uh, there's apps that you can download and use. I'm a big fan of Google Calendar. Um, there are great YouTube videos on how to make the most of a Google Calendar. They're two, three minutes and teach you how to use it. I like it because you can merge several calendars into one. Um, so I can have each of my children's calendar, my work calendar, my husband's calendar, um, you know, the band's calendar for my son or, you know, my daughter's theater calendar, whatever it is, it can all be merged into one, and that way you really get the big picture of what's happening. Um, everybody can have their section can have their own color, but that way you can see, and the nice thing is you can share that, your whole family can be on it, and that way everybody knows the score, everybody knows what's happening. You know, your partner can look at it and go, oh wow, Saturday's really busy, I better not plan anything else. Your kids can look at it if they have smartphones and, or computers and look and say, oh, yeah, no, I can't have a sleepover Saturday night because this is what's happening. So it, it kind of saves them asking you questions they can answer themselves, and it also lets them get the big picture and know what's going on. So some of the tips to making the most out of your family calendar that we came up with are one, come up with a system that works for your family. If your kids don't have smartphones or your husband or partner doesn't or wife, if everybody's kind of more analog and better with paper, go that way. Or if you're very wired, there are great apps that you can use. So decide what everybody in your family would use. Schedule time to update it. Um, just like you're going to do your inbox, even at the same time, just stop and review the calendar and make sure everything's in there. Make sure the right people have access to it. So whether that's your partner, your sitter, your extended family that supports you, your children, um, whoever that might be, make sure they have access to that calendar, wherever it is. Add regularly scheduled events as soon as you can. So you know, your children come home and they give you the school calendar or if they're involved in any extracurriculars you get that calendar, take the time to stop and put those in the calendar right then and that way you know it's done, you can plan around it and it's set. There are some schools now have moved to a system, um, for example the school system here in Austin, a lot of the um, programs use a program called Charms and you can actually merge that into your calendar. So for example if your child's a football player or in theater you can download that calendar and it merges right into yours. So whatever you need to do to make sure everything gets on there so that you have one place that really lays out the big picture of what's going on, that's going to be the most useful. And be sure and book early whenever possible and we'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute. So a good calendar will save your sanity. It really is one of the best time savers and stress savers that I know. So I polled um, some of the staff here at the Johnson Center as well as some of the families that we serve and just asked them, hey, what are some of the things you do in your house to keep your family organized? And these were some of the great tips they shared. Um, one was to keep all your medication supplements in one location and keep a schedule of those nearby. So for whichever family member may be taking any, keep that all in one place. That way you'll always know what you have, how much you have, and where it is. Consider buying household items in bulk. If you have the space um, or can make the space, and we can talk a little bit more later about how you can make some space, to do that, that can save you a lot of extra trips to the store and stress and running out of things. Auto ship is a great feature for people who use online shopping. Um, Amazon and I think Target and maybe some other shops have this. So for example, here at the office if we use unscented hand soap and I know we use 12 bottles a month of unscented hand soap and I can set up an auto ship to get 12 bottles a month delivered on the first every month, I don't have to think about it anymore. We're not going to run out, it's done. And the bonus is a lot of the stores, for example Amazon, I believe you save 15% on auto ship, so you save some money doing that as well. Schedule time to do a toys, clothes, and book swap um, purge a couple times a year. So kids outgrow toys or toy, uh, cl and clothes. Uh, toys and clothes get outdated. You read books and then just stick them on a shelf never to touch them again. Go through a couple times a year and get rid of the things that you don't use anymore. Uh, decluttering yourself, your life, your house, can make things move a lot smoother because you can find things easily and it just feels less stressful. 
And this is one I particularly love. Uh, stock up on cards, greeting cards. You know, take a nice hour, get yourself a nice cup of coffee, and go to the card store and pick out several birthday cards, wedding cards, thank you cards, um, things like that, so that you have a stash. That way, every time an event rolls around, you don't have to go to the store. You can have your own mini store and go and pull it, throw a stamp on it, and you're done. Same thing for hostess gifts, housewarming gifts, small teacher gifts, trinkets, things like that. If you have a hand, full on um, hand, then you save yourself that time and that. Uh, effort and go out and get it and you can pull those together. Um, same thing with maybe uh, general boys and girls birthday gifts if your kids are at the age where they're going to a lot of birthday parties having a couple on hand will save you having to fit it in sometimes when you're really busy. Some other general tips. We already talked about having one place for an inbox. Put up a we need board in your house and teach your family how to use it. So this is, could be a chalkboard, dry erase board, notepad hung up that you get everybody in the habit of putting down whenever they've used the last of something. So we have a chalkboard in our kitchen. When my kids notice that they're using the last of the shampoo, I've taught them, you come down and you write, we need shampoo on the board or toothpaste or whatever it may be. Um, if you're cooking and you use the last of anything and you notice, hey, we're down to the bottom of the olive oil, I'm going to write it on the board. That way when it comes time to make my grocery list, it's easy to replace the things I know we need. I don't have to go hunting to say, are we out of this, are we out of that? It's all there on the board. And it takes a little bit of time to get everybody in the habit, but it's such a great time saver and such a great stress reliever to know. It all just goes up there and you don't have to look. Once again, I'm going to repeat now and probably again later, schedule time to get organized. Some of the suggestions we got had to do with saving time in the kitchen, which is great because I think a lot of us spend a lot of time in there cooking for our families um, or trying to cook for our families. So one thing is to cook and freeze. If you have freezer space or fridge space or an extra freezer, you know, if you're going to take the time to make one meal, double it, freeze half of it, and you've saved yourself cooking another night. Uh, plan and prep in advance. This can look like a lot of things. You know, one thing is we all, you know, if you've watched Chopped or any of those great cooking shows, it's so exciting because they're not spending time pulling stuff out of the pantry and the drawers and chopping and mix. It's all in little bowls ready to go for them right there. Well, be your own prep cook, your own sous chef, and prep whatever you can in advance. If you've got, you know, some time on Sunday night and you can chop some onions and chop some carrots and pre measure some things out that's going to make cooking during the week a lot easier, do that. If you can go ahead and make a meal in advance and stick it in the freezer or fridge and pull it out later in the week, that's a time saver too. For any snacks or lunches that can be pre-packed, you could do that. You know, pre-portion out snack sizes of, you know, pretzels or popcorn or dried fruit or whatever it is your child takes for a snack. Then you just grab one and go instead of taking the time each morning to do that or your kids forgetting to do that. If you have a friend, neighbor, family member whose dietary preferences are similar to your family, set up a meal swap. That way you can each save each other a night of cooking. Sometimes you get to try some different things, um, but it's a great way to spread the love. And again, once again, you're cooking already, double it, give one to a friend. They do the same thing the next night. You've helped each other out. Uh, you can keep a staples grocery list, so kind of the core things that you know you're going to buy. Keep that. That way you have to check off what you need. It's similar to that posting an I need board, but a way to save a little bit of time and make sure you get what you need so you don't have to make a repeat trip to the store. I like this, you know, I confess uh, we all have a junk drawer. I ambitiously tried when we moved into our house not to have one a few years ago um, then it became the junk basket um, but I do try to make time each week to clear it out so that things don't accumulate there that do have a home. We'd love for you to uh, share some of your tips with us. I did pull some of the families we serve here and they made some great suggestions that I wanted to pass along to you. I thought this was a great one. One mom said that she made space for more storage by getting rid of all their DVD and CD boxes and she just put the DVD and CDs in little plastic sleeves in a little box and she actually gained three tall bookshelves in doing that. They had a large collection of Disney DVDs and things like that and she was able to take three bookshelves worth and purge it down into two boxes that took up, you know, a tenth of the space and then she had all that free storage space to put more stuff. 
Uh, one mom talked about making a checklist for herself and her kids to get ready in the evening so that saved time getting out the door in the morning and then also backtracking to get forgotten items, which I know we've all done from time to time. Um, and this is a great one because it could be modified for almost anyone to use, whether this is a picture exchange system that you use one card at a time with your child, your young child, or a child that needs a little more support, all the way up to teenagers, everyone can participate in sitting down the night before and making sure they're ready to go for the next day. And so you can make it as simple or as complicated as you want. I like the fact that this really gets everyone involved and it's gonna teach your kids that thought process and thinking through what do they need to get through their next day. I alluded to this before, but I think it's really important never to leave an appointment without scheduling the next one. This not only saves you the time to think about it and to make the phone call to do it and to fit it into a busy schedule, that way it's set and you plan around it so it's more likely to happen. Uh, storing all your documents in a fire safe box, these are little um, these can be as small as a little shoe box all the way up to big um, boxes that lock that are fire resistant or fireproof and you can keep all your important documents in them that's great because then you always know where they are and in the event of an emergency you can just grab it and go and you have them for those of you that attended our webinar or have listened in to our webinar on insurance um, you knew, know the importance of phone logs and how what a great tool they can be um, they're great to keep organized too so if you just jot down, whether it's in a notebook, an app in your phone, whatever that is, um, any important calls that have taken place, the who, what, when, where, and why, um, I can't tell you how many times I've had to refer back to mine. Everything from dealing with insurance companies uh, and doctor's offices, you know, I just had an issue with a um, computer company that will remain unnamed, but in talking to them, they said, oh, you know, no, we didn't say that was ready, and I was able to say, you know, actually on June 27th, this person called me at this time and said it was ready to be picked up. Um, because I had those kind of details, they were like, oh, well, they were, yes, oh, okay, they were able to backtrack and, and fix the issue. If I just said, you know, I talked to somebody sometime, I think they would have been far less likely to um, be of help. So it comes in handy in a lot of different situations. This is one I think is really important and one I've really struggled to learn as I've gotten older, but is making a big difference. And that is to really always think about what it is you're bringing into your home, your office, whatever it is, make sure it's something you either really, really need or really, really love. Because I think we get, um, I was just having a conversation with another parent about how all the birthday party um, goodie bag stuff accumulates, you know, all those little toys that your kids play with for three seconds and they end up in the bottom of the drawer. Um, you know, having a way to deal with that that doesn't clutter your life is just a gift to yourself. So, and it's, a, I think, a gift to teach your children that really only spend your money, spend your time on things that you love or really need. And so just being mindful about that when you're out and thinking about what you're bringing into your house can help eliminate a lot of clutter. We would love for you all to share your ideas with us, whether um, now or email or a call. It's information that we can share with the families we serve here. We can share on our social media pages or in blogs or future webinars. So if you have some tips or tricks we haven't touched on here today, we would love to hear from you and have you share those with us so that we can share them with others. So now we're going to talk about the Palm Book. So the Palm Book, it sounds like a very cheery thing. And this is something that I put together about 16, 17 years ago when I had my first child. Um, you know, I found I was constantly telling my husband things or, or my parents things out of an anxiety to make sure they had information should I not be around. Whether that I was just really sick or something worse happened or I needed to go take care of a relative. And so I decided to put it all down in writing. And it's made a big difference. I really think that being prepared um, for kind of those worst case scenarios, reduced my stress and anxiety a lot, but also in the preparing got me a lot more organized. And so as my kids got older and challenges got harder sometimes, it really came in handy and, and became clear what a useful tool this could be. So listen to our dear founding president and, and let's be prepared. So the POM book stands for Peace of Mind, it's your Peace of Mind book. 
That's my uh, politically correct name for it, honestly, in my house. I call it the bus book. I call it that because it's the thing that if I walk out the door today and get hit by a bus, I can be confident in knowing someone else could step into my house and things would hopefully, you know, after an appropriate time of warning, carry on without a lot of disruption or hardship. So all kidding aside, um, I think it's a really important tool, not only in an emergency, but also just to keep you organized and put all this information into one place. So everybody's could look different. It's going to depend on your family and what your family needs. But for example, in mine, I have important numbers, a daily schedule, school information, medical information, therapy information, dietary information, and financial information. So I'm going to go through each of these sections and give you some examples of what could go in them. I'm going to go kind of fast and it's a lot of information. We are going to put this webinar up on our YouTube channel so that you can refer back to it. And sometime next week we'll get a blog put up on our blog on our website that will go through this with some screenshots so that you'll have a template for making your own book. So section one is important numbers. It could look like this. Um, so you're going to put, you know, think about it when you're preparing this as if I was going to be gone for the next month for whatever reason and my neighbor Susie had to come in and take over my family, who might she need to call? And let's put those numbers down here. So what are the emergency numbers? What are my family members' numbers? Who, what are the neighbors' numbers, my therapist, my tutors, my teachers, my dog walker, the pharmacy, whoever it is that comes in and out of your life that they may need to call, what are those numbers and let's put those down. Some supporting information that might be in this section could be a copy of your insurance card, the front and back, a copy of your prescription benefit card if that's different, if you have pets, any vet insurance or vet information, any relevant business cards, um, who, you know, who's your plumber, who, who do you call, who's your handyman, anything like that, any household numbers to take care of the house, home warranty numbers, plumbers, lawn people, housekeepers, um, you know, dog walkers, like I said, whoever comes in and out of your house, uh, what their number and how can they reach them. The next section is the daily schedule, and this is different than the calendar. This is really where you will just want to give a snapshot of a day in the life. And this is really important for those of you who have young kids or kids who crave uh, stability and consistency. This is where you're going to communicate those routines and those little details that can make a big difference, particularly in a stressful situation. So, you know, I was just talking to a mom we have here who was telling me about her child's elaborate bedtime routine. And while we're trying to address that so it's not quite so elaborate, you know, for now, when they do this routine, there's peace in the house. When they don't, there's not. So this would be where you convey that. If your child has preferences of things they do in their free time, you know, if they have a special chair, whatever it is that makes them comfortable, communicate that here so that a caretaker knows and can deal with it without upsetting the apple cart any more than it may have already been. So it could look like this. Um, it's just kind of a typical day in the life. You know, does your child prefer to shower before they come down to breakfast or after? Where do they sit? This is also a great place to communicate house rules. If you limit electronics or they only gain access to some fun activity of going to the park after homework instead of before. This is where you can communicate those house rules so that they can be maintained in your absence. You can list, um, you can see there we've listed things that they can be do, that they can do in free time. So if someone's had to come, let's say you go away for the weekend to take care of your mother and a sitter comes in, they'll get some ideas for things they can do in their free time. Supporting documentation for this section might include a copy of any schedules, you know, school schedules, therapy schedules, tutoring schedules, things like that directions to any of the places that you've listed, information or brochures on some of those preferred or free time activities. If you have any programs that you're running for self-help or daily living skills, if you have picture schedules or things that your children use um, throughout the day, you could include them there. Any play date or social uh, contact information, if you have friends that you get together with regularly, you can include that there. So our next section is school information somewhat self-explanatory. Where do your kids attend school? Who are their teachers? What are school times? 
how do they get to school? Do they take a bus, carpool? Do you take them? Do they take their lunch? Do they buy their lunch at school? Do they have after school activities? Should they expect any information to be coming home? Um, things like that. This is where you would convey that. And then supporting documentation for this section could include, again, copies of school schedules, any copies of report cards. This would tell them what classes they're taking, who their teachers are, maybe any areas that they're struggling with or need help with. If you have tutors, any tutoring information or websites that you use as resources to help them with their homework. A copy of their current IEP or 504 plan if they have one. A map to the school or directions to schools. A contact list for any additional teachers. So you might give them the homeroom teacher, but that include, you know, if you need to email the history teacher, here's their contact. The gym teacher, here's their contact. And then if your kids do have an IEP, a 504, or any issues, any advocacy support information. Um, you know, worst case scenario, if you're away for a while, you want someone to know, you know, if you're having trouble, if you're not getting those weekly reports that are mandated by the IEP, or if, you know, you feel like he's getting left out, here are some resources that you can go to to educate yourself on how to advocate for them. And then I know a lot of schools have moved into um, having online platforms that they post their homework or grades or things like that. So include any login information for those school websites. Our next section is the medical information section. So this is really where you want to give a snapshot. And on the first page I would think about what are those questions that get asked in an emergency. If you have a babysitter at your house and your child has a seizure or an anaphylactic reaction or breaks a bone and they have to rush them to the emergency room, they can grab this notebook and take it with them and they'll have those answers at their hands. What are their allergies? Have they been hospitalized or had surgeries? What medications are they on? Um, you know, wh who is their doctor? Include that information and that way they'll have it and they can convey that quickly in an emergency so that your child gets best care. Some supporting documents for this section might include a medication and supplement schedule. Um, so again, this is where they can find it to stay consistent, but also in emergency share what medication or supplements they're taking. Any current treatment notes from any providers that you have. A doctor's note for medications or allergies. So a lot of times if, um, for example, your child has to take a medication at school, it requires a doctor's note, have a copy of that note there so they can uh, have it ready at hand. Any payment or insurance information for doctor's visits. So, you know, what is your copay? How much can they expect to pay? What is your insurance? Any recent lab assessments could go there. Any vaccine records or exemptions. An authorization for minors medical treatment. You can find these forms online. So essentially this is saying I authorize the caretaker to take my child to the hospital. Um, and if they've broken a bone, they can authorize setting the bone. If they've, um, you know, need Im immediate care, because sometimes if you're out of pocket or not reached, it can create a dilemma unless it's a true critical emergency, and your child may have to wait a little while while they try to reach someone to get authorization. So if you have this form, um, it can make treatment come faster. So it's something to consider. And then supplement and medication shopping information. And I'm going to show you some examples of this in just a second. So for the medication and supplement schedules, there are commercial apps available. This can be a handwritten note. This can be an Excel spreadsheet. Um, but it is something to keep in there as a daily reminder and checklist. Like I said, there's commercial applications available. It's great for clinical appointments. You know, you're going to keep it in there for emergencies. But if you keep it up to date in there, each time you have an appointment, you just have to make a copy of what you have in there. You don't have to recreate the wheel and do a new one. It provides an ease in communication, so you can, if you have a partner or a sitter or another caregiver, it's a way to communicate across the two of you what medication or supplements have been given. Um, and the shopping list we'll talk about in just a second. Um, I, I do want to mention right now a great organization tip. Uh, I don't have a lot of time to go into it today, but pill organizers are fantastic. If you or anyone in your family takes more than a few medications or supplements, look at pill organizers. Um, you know, I take multivitamins and essential fatty acids and probiotics and that kind of thing, and I have a one-week pill organizer that I sit down Sunday night, I put all my pills in it, and then I'm done for the week. And then if I'm going out, I can just grab that section. Um, it just makes it a lot easier. I can put the bottles away for a week, and I have it all in one small handy place. There's lots of different choices, 
We've talked about these in some of our other webinars you can listen to, but look into pill organizers as a way to make pill administration and medication administration a lot easier and more organized. So here's an example of a supplement schedule. Um, you know, like I said, it might look very different. I like this form because it lists not only everything that this person takes and when they take it and how much they take, we've provided sections there that as you've dosed it, you can check it off. And so that way, if you share caregiver responsibilities with someone else, your partner or another caregiver, and you go through and you check, you make sure that it's being given and that no do double dose happens because if you check it off and you give it, someone can look and go, oh, well, you already did that for today. And so it's just a good accountability form. It also can give you a picture if you're having trouble being consistent with taking medication, going back and looking at this over a few weeks and go, you know, wow, Wednesdays at lunch, we're never getting our medication. Why? And then you can think about, you know, is that because I'm not here? Do I need to think about a way that I can take that with me? So it's also a great problem solving tool. This is an example of a um, shopping list. So this is a great thing to keep, A, for yourself so you can remember where you got everything, but also, again, in the event that someone else needs to help you with this, they can look and say, oh, gosh, we're out of this multivitamin. Let me go to that section. Oh, let's see. She buys, it's a compounded multivitamin that she gets at this specialty store. Here's the phone number. I'm going to call them and order a new one. So it's an easy way to, to get those. You know, she orders this supplement off of Amazon. I'm going to reorder that. So it's a great way to uh, keep those things up to date when you're not able to. So the next section would be therapy information. This may or may not apply to your family, but if your child is doing any kind of therapy, whether that's speech, OT, PT, ABA, music, play therapy, whatever it is, this is where you can communicate that. So again, it's just the snapshot. This is what he's doing. This is where he goes. This is how you reach them. Here's their cancellation policy. That's an important thing to convey. Um, and also kind of tell the caregiver what to expect. You know, do they need to go in with the child? Do they wait in the lobby when the child comes out? Are they going to bring anything with them that we should take home? Um, do they get some kind of treat afterwards? You know, just so that things stay consistent and everybody's comfortable, you can really outline um, what that looks like. And that way, again, it decreases anxiety and keeps everything running smoothly. Some of the supporting documents for this section might include a copy of current therapy reports, including programs and goals, gives them the snapshot of what they're working on, a list of resources to learn more about these therapies. If heaven forbid you're called away or are away for an extended period of time, this can give a caregiver the chance to educate themselves a little more. Any referral letters or prescriptions for therapy should go there. Again, we know that a lot of times these come in handy, whether it's, you know, for insurance purposes, to get something done at school, to get a re refill, or, or whatever that might be, it's important to keep those referral letters together. How do you pay for therapies? Um, this is an important one. If you know you have a caregiver who's taking some of the speech, they need to know, do they have to pay at the time of service? Are they billed? Is someone who's taking over long term, those bills get sent? Do I submit those to insurance? How does that work? So just a brief description on how that gets paid for. And then a copy of any assessments. Our next section is dietary information. If this applies to your family, this, um, you know, anyone can put a section in that says, you know, this is how our family eats. This is where we shop. You know, we avoid these things. We like these things. You know, these are the foods we try to buy organic. These are the things. Anything you prefer, this is where you might communicate that. And if you add in, if you have anyone in your family with allergies or intolerances, certainly that's something you would note here. And if you are working with a dietitian or a nutritionist, you can put their contact information as well. So supporting documents for this section might include a short description of any dietary plan that any family member is on, a sample weekly meal plan. So just think about, sit down and say, okay, what did we eat last week? Well, okay, here's an example of breakfast, here's examples of lunch, here's examples of dinner. That can give someone a snapshot, an idea of where they can get started. Any shopping lists, uh, notes or recommendations from your registered dietitian or nutritionist. Any resources for more information, particularly if there's allergies um, or intolerances. This sounds funny, but copies of old grocery receipts, this is as good as a shopping list. If someone can look back and say, oh, I see, you know, every week they buy this, and here's the kind of crackers they buy, and this is the kind of bread they buy. So it's almost as good as a shopping list. 
a list of any favorite recipes or meals. Um, this is great, um, particularly you know if you have specific family recipes or things that your children really love, it's great to include that. This could also be a fun project for your family to put together, um, a little mini cookbook of your fam family's favorites. And then if you eat out, um, a list of your favorite restaurants, menus, directions, if there's um, you know particular allergies or intolerances, you know, is there a specific menu for that, or there's just certain dishes they can order, include that, and particularly in a short-term emergency, that's great if someone's just stepped in and they need to feed your kids and they think, okay, I'm just going to take them out for dinner, having some suggestions of where they can go and what they can eat can make that really helpful. And last, we have financial information. So I say this with a caveat, you know, if this is sitting out in your uh, kitchen where anybody can find it, you don't want to list all your credit card numbers and bank account numbers and passwords. Um, so use some common sense, but you also do need to have a plan in place for if someone comes in and there's some information they need. So if you have an accountant um, who is hopefully not Ebenezer Scrooge, uh, put that contact information there. If you want them to know where your checkbook is or your credit card information is, um, I can remember when I was an older teenager and my mom would go out of town and a cousin would come stay, she would always write a check, you know, for $50 and leave it in the drawer so in an emergency we could cash that check and have some money short term. So just things like that to think about. Um, how do you want someone to deal with an emergency? Again, list how people are paid. Again, if that's a babysitter, uh, you know, whatever you have, if it's someone coming to your house, how do you pay those people? Some supporting documentation for this section could include your bank account information, where your will is located, and you should have a will, um, financial advisor information if you have one, maybe your family budget, therapy costs, copies of your insurance policies, both health and life, and instructions on passwords. And again, you may not want to put those out there open, but you do need a plan for how to communicate those. Um, and I will just say there was a great article fairly recently in the New York Times about a new organization that was formed by a woman uh, whose husband passed away when he was pretty young, and she got left in limbo because she knew really nothing about their finances and didn't know their passwords and didn't know where things were located, and it really sent her on a painful journey for a couple of years to get her financial picture straightened out. So she started an organization, it's called GYST, I think their website is gyst.org, it stands for Get Your Stuff Together, um, and it's really all about how to avoid that, and they'll give you um, options for apps and things to store your passwords, um, a checklist for making sure you do have kind of your emergency bases covered, whether that's you know wills and things like that, and they can send you weekly reminders until you have it in place. You don't have to use that, but think of some way to make sure that you have some of those bases covered, because in the event of an emergency, it's really, really important. So some things to remember. Start somewhere. Um, this was a lot. You're not going to get all this done tonight, or even this week, or probably even this month. But just start somewhere. Maybe pick one section. You know, This week, I'm going to sit down and make a phone list. Next week, I'll gather the supporting information for that phone list. The next week I'm going to sit down and make my school brain dump. Then the next week I'll pull together. So, you know, if you do that in a couple months' time, you're going to have the binder built and ready to go, and it's really easy to keep up to date at that point. So just pick a place and get started. Once it's done, just flip through it once a month and make sure it's up to date. Keep it in the same place so that you can always find it and people can find it in an emergency and let important people know where it's kept. Whoever you think would step in, whether that's a sitter, a neighbor, a sister, a parent, just say, hey, you should just know we have all our emergency information on a bookshelf in a white binder in the office or wherever it is. This is a really important point that I've only recently, recently realized, but as your kids get older, involve them in the process. You know, you don't have to have call conversations about what happens in the event of an emergency, but just say, you know, we really think it's important, you know, if something happened, if grandma broke her leg and I needed to go help her, we want to make sure that someone can come in and keep things going. So keep them involved in that process because it's going to teach them how to do it as they get older. And they may have feedback for you on some of those sections on how you can update them. You should back up the information. Um, if you type all this out on your computer, that's great, back it up. But it is important to keep a printed physical copy. I'm all for going paperless, except in this instance, again, you need something someone can grab if they're on their way to the emergency room. They're not going to be able to grab it off your computer like that. So I'm not sure we have any time for questions today. Um, I have some great suggestions. You guys offered some great tips, and we will certainly offer those up 
through um, future webinars, blogs, and on our social media pages. Um, I want to say hi to the person who just gave me a shout out from South Africa. We're glad you could join us. Um, I have seen a couple questions here about how do I get my child with autism to follow the schedule. Um, I'm not sure we have enough time to go into that, but I think it's important. Um, you know, we want to give our kids as much uh, independence and self-help skills as we can and honor and respect their choices. So I think that involving them, you know, if they have a preference for how their schedule goes, if your family and their schedule has the flexibility to do that, that's fine. Um, whether that's coming up with a picture schedule or a short written one, um, getting them involved in your family's um, day-to-day -day life and keeping things going is not only a way that they're included in the family, which they should be, but also a way that they can learn those skills for themselves. So, you know, even if it's as simple as um, you have school tomorrow, let's take your backpack by the door and you go with them and do it and they build that habit that every night the backpack goes by the door, that's one step forward. And if the next one is, do you want to wear the red shirt or the blue shirt tomorrow, let's lay it out. That's another step. So you can start really simple and build from there. And um, We have lots of webinars on how to teach communication and skill building on our YouTube channel. Check those out. Um, but I think it's important to get them involved um, all the way up to you know, when your kids get into high school and you start filling out transition surveys, they're going to ask them things like, you know, do they know um, where to buy groceries? Uh, all the way to more complicated things like, do they know what a social security number is and where to find that and how to use it? So starting simple and building up is really going to build these um, life care skills and organization skills and independent living skills that will serve them well. So last, we're going to talk just briefly about first steps and where to get started um, because I know this has been a lot and it can be overwhelming. I'm not going to tell you it's easy, but I am going to tell you it's worth it. I'm not going to tell you I'm good at it. It's something I struggle with all the time, which is why I'm talking about this. But it is something that the struggle is worth it because every step forward you make, no matter how small, makes your life better, gives you more time with your family, reduces your stress and anxiety, so it is worth it. And quite frankly, it always, always, always starts with a list. Love a good list. Whether that's you're just getting started, start and make a list to say, these are the hardest parts of my life. How can I get more organized to address these hard parts in my life? Then break it down and say, okay, if number one is I can never find anything in our house, or um, I'm late to everything, or I can't find time to do anything. Okay, if that's where we're starting, how can we address that? whether it's getting organized in your house, creating more time by looking at our schedules and saying how can we do this more streamlined and organized. Starting with where you want to fix it is going to lead to that next step of what you can do. So you're not going to get it done overnight, but if you take the first step, that leads to the next step, which leads to the next step, and eventually you're where you want to be. It's really, really important to get your children, both because they can help you once they learn those skills, and it's also important to teach them because it's how they're going to learn to do it on their own. And it's really important because it's important to take care of yourself. So think about ways first that you can make your life easier. Even if it's as simple as, if I don't have to yell at everybody in the morning to get out the door, that's going to make my life better, that's great. We want you to fill your cup up so that you have room in your life to take care of others. So it's important to think about ways to make your life go a little easier. So I hope this has been helpful. I hope you've learned something uh, new. I hope that you'll share with us your ideas so that we can pass them along to others. Um, I think it's an important thing for parents to talk about and to learn from one another in this situation. And if there's anything you can offer, we would appreciate it. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me at the email address on the screen. Uh, again, we will be posting this on the YouTube channel, and we'll be posting some blogs with some screenshots of some of these in the coming week, so watch our Facebook and Twitter pages for announcements on those, and I thank you for your time and attention. Have a great afternoon.